Your kids are not supposed to be you. Got it? <laughs> Thank you. So just because I like math and I went into finance doesn't mean my kids were going to do that. I didn't know much about science. And one of my sons loves science. How did I know that? Because I spent a lot of time with them. On the weekends, I would take them different places, and I would be watching. I wanted to see what, what was charging them up. What, what did they get excited about? We said, what makes your heart sing? This is the language of a father to a son, right? It's like, tell me about it. Like, I want to find the calling in there, because I want to pull it out. I don't want to assume that your calling is my calling. And, and all of a sudden, boom, we took, took him to Liberty Science Center when it first opened up. And, and it lit him up. And then later, a teacher in high school really lit him up about biology. And that's the one who's getting a PhD now in, in cancer research, right? Because you have to be intentional about this stuff. Don't just expect it to happen. You, you know, there's a thousand different choices they have, but you're their dad. And you're going to help them find the thing that they've been called to do. You're going to call it out of them. He has a brother, very different mi gift of mix, uh, mix of gifts. And his brother was. The younger brother loved to look at maps. It's amazing. It's just how you find things. One of my clients gave me one of these big atlas, color atlases, like 300 pages about every capital of every city in the world. And you, know, you get to Europe, and some of those capitals are stunning, the architecture. And he loved it. And he would read through this thing, and he would spend hours just looking at all these pages. And you know, if you ever got one of those, the smell of the pages when you were a little kid, it just like grabbed them and brought them in. And all of a sudden, these video games start coming out, and there's one called Sim City. Anybody remember that? It's like you get to be the architect that builds this city on the computer. Guess what he studied? Architecture. <laughs> OK? Now, there was 500 other things that it could have been, but you don't know until you start sifting it out and working with them and asking them questions and talk to their guidance counselor. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Train them up in the way they should go so that when they get old, they will not depart from it. Because you're giving them a great gift. And the best gift we can give you as Christians coming here is to find your calling and help you blossom into who God called you to be. And it, it's pretty dramatic sometimes how different you are when you walk in to what happens after you start to blossom. Some folks that could not even get near a microphone, Cindy, didn't even want to talk in front of people, now is teaching classes, preaching on a Sunday. Debbie, remember? Didn't want to talk, now comes up and gives testimony. See, because something that was in there was dormant, but the language of a son and a father is, nope, that's coming alive. I'm going to find what you were created for, and you're going to step into it. Amen. Amen. OK, I'm going slow here. I'm sorry. What time is it? Two hours of preaching so far, it says here. It's 12 o'clock. All right, so we're getting closer. I think I might skip one or two here. What do you think? Ephesians 2, 19. You got that one? You're no longer wandering exiles. How cool is that? Somebody comes in broken, doing drugs, they get saved. Now all of a sudden, they're not wandering exiles anymore. They found their father. They found their compass. They found their true north. I'm no longer a wandering exile. The kingdom of faith is now my home country. I'm no longer a stranger or an outsider, but I belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. Hallelujah. God is building a home, and he's using us all irrespective of how we got here in what he's building. So your background, your past doesn't matter to God. It's your present and your right now and what you plan on doing about it going forward. Doesn't mean that there's not consequences about things we did in the past. There could be some bad mistakes that we made and that we still have to pay for those mistakes. But we got a fresh start and we're moving forward. And I'm not a slave to fear, as that song says that Jonathan uh, Helser wrote, right? I'm no longer a slave to fear. This picture is something that we use in uh, Possessing Your Vessel on, on something called Identifications of Love. And there's these reports that you could read and you could look it up on the internet for whooping cranes. I don't know if I'm saying that right, whooping cranes. But they were, going to, they were about to be extinct. So in order to try to help these birds, they would take the eggs and they'd incubate them. And then they didn't have the mother there. So they would have to create a cloaking system to imitate the mother. So this is a person in that white robe, but their arm is stretched out like the neck and the head of the mother whooping crane. And you see that young, 
gullible bird coming up to take the food. But it's a great example of how Satan can cloak himself as light. See? But in the absence of a father, we're going to connect with something. It's called imprinting in the class, if you remember that. Imprinting means that when a child is born, there's a compass on the inside that has to attach to something. And if a father is there, they'll attach to the father. But nature abhors a vacuum. You know who said that? Aristotle. That was a few years ago. You know what it means. If a father's not there, the child is going to look for what Danny Silk calls a man print. I need a man print. Somebody's got to show me what to do because I don't figure this out on my own. And if it's a gang, then it's a gang because that will fill that vacuum. It will fill that void. Is that God's plan? No. God's plan would be that the father be there. If the father's not there, they're not going to go without a man print. Somebody is going to print them. What they need is a dad print, more than a man print. Now, look, a lot of us might not have had it very good, but we have the church now. We have God. We have the Father as our Father. Whatever, like he would say, I had a toolbox deficiency. I didn't have a man that I could look to as a good example. I was missing tools in my toolbox. So I, so I picked up the wrong tools. But God rearranges all of that. When you come into a life-giving culture and you're with, with emotionally healthy men who love the Lord and are willing to be held accountable, and that's exactly what Danny Silk said. I had all these men that were married for 25 years. He said, I never knew anybody that was married more than 15 in my whole life. I didn't think you could be married more than 15 years. Now all of a sudden, the elders in the church were coming around him. The, the married couples were taking him with them. And now all of a sudden, his toolbox was getting filled up. And he, and he was getting a dad print instead of a man print. Oh, man, there's no comparison, is there? I'm going to keep going. I have too much to say. <laughs> All right, that's what I said. This is the devil now. You belong to your father, Satan. Jesus is speaking, and he's talking to the Pharisees and say, you belong to your father, Satan, and you want to carry out your father's desires. That's John chapter 8, 44. So isn't it a true thing that whoever that is that we're connected to, we're going to try to carry out those desires? If it's the gang, you want to impress the gang. If it's God, you want to impress God. You're going to listen and try to carry out your father's desires. But from the start, Satan was a murderer. And he's never stood by the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's speaking in character because he's a liar. Indeed, the inventor of the lie. And then you know John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But let me tell you, that cloaking looks very authentic. And we've gotten tricked many times by a cloak and thinking it was the real thing, and it turned out to be a counterfeit. And God says, you know what? No matter how many bad mistakes you've made, I still want to be your father. You cannot disqualify yourself from me accepting you as my child. I will adopt you into the family, and you get written into the will. You're not going to be a second-class citizen. You get written into the will. You have an inheritance, a legal inheritance in the will of the Father who owns a cattle on a thousand hill, all the silver and gold. I'm happy about that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I made a lot of bad mistakes. <laughs> He's not holding it against me. 